David coming in, uh, Seattle Bell, and Henry the Token were waiting for confirmation from one other speaker who was invited uh, as well uh, to, to speak at that CLE. Uh, so mark your calendars for August 31st. And then, of course, in October, we have a two-day, 10-hour CLE. This will be the seventh annual 10-hour CLE for the Public Defender's Office. So we'll put them on at that time uh, for mark your calendars. All right. Brian Weiss, as I said, is one of the lawyers that most people know as being preeminent. He has been on it multiple times, one of Texas' top criminal and appellate post-conviction lawyers, a, freak, a frequent CLE speaker, and he's a former course director for the Advanced Criminal Law Court. He's been honored by uh, PCDLA uh, in 2016 as Attorney of the Year. He was honored by ACCLA as Attorney of the Year. He's been a super lawyer nearly every year since 2011, and he's noted as one of the top lawyers in Texas. Uh, but, you know, I first met Brian Weiss years ago that I had an opportunity to work with him on case. I was representing this kid uh, who was 15, 14 at the time, and the capital murder was committed. Uh, he was certified as an adult, went to trial, and got a life sentence. And, uh, and I, I got hired by his family and gave me peanuts to do an appeal. And I was moved by the case, and I filed an appellate brief after doing some research. I filed the brief, and then I got a call from Brian Weiss. And he says, you know, Eric, I was watching, I saw that you found a brief in this case, and I'm interested in helping you with this case. And, and of course, you know, I, I knew who Brian Weiss was. Didn't know him personally. So I asked a couple of lawyers, and the lawyer said, no, I don't get him to work with you on that case. You don't need him to work with you on that case. No, I don't do it, don't do it. And I was kind of surprised, you know. I was like, oh, I wonder why you work with Brian Weiss. So I talked to the client, and I talked to the client's family, and I knew who Brian was, and I knew that he would help the client. So I checked my ego, and I said, yes. And Brian got on the case, didn't charge a plea, now, didn't charge a case, got on the case, did the research, filed the supplemental brief, came in and argued the case, and we got a reversal of the conviction. And this kid who had a life sentence got a reversal in the case. But that wasn't really what told me who Brian Weiss was. Because the case was one that every media outlet was interested in. Every media outlet in Houston was interested in, of course, right? And so, most people would expect that if a lawyer like Brian Weiss did all of that, that he was going to be the one that was going to be leading everything with the media, and I'd be sitting off in the corner. <laughs> it was the exact opposite. Brian came in, gave me some speaking points, told me what issues need to be raised, because this is an issue of great public importance. And he sat <coughs> to the side and let me do this, this, this press conference. And kind of just helped there with their support. And ever since then, my opinion of Brian Weiss was solidified. That he wasn't some media hog. You know, he's a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't some glory hound. He was a man that had a heart for the people. And he cared about the people. It blew me away. I so, care for uh, the I'm people. I'm kind of biased towards Brian White. There's a whole bunch of haters of Brian White. <laughs> <laughs> only, only the women who have dated me. Come on, let's be <laughs> fair. Oh, I see one of them right over but, there. But I'm, Brian, I'm, I'm biased towards Brian White because I know a little bit more. I learned something about his character. So uh, it's with pleasure uh, that, that I present. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. The client that E spoke of was, as I understand it at the time, the youngest inmate in TDCJ doing life without parole. And that is no longer the case. First of all, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here to speak to you today about preservation of air. And you can see from the first title slide in my PowerPoint, this, not coincidentally, was a speech that I gave last week at the Advanced Criminal Law course. So you are going to hear the exact same speech and not pay a penny for it. God bless each and every one of you. But because the Advanced course, and by the way, point of, of personal privilege, last week's Advanced course, I believe, was the best in the history of the seminar. Do not in small part to my protege, Gypsy sidekick from Clear Lake, Carmen Rowe, who was the course director and knocked it out of the park. Give her a hand right now. And it's interesting because at the advanced course, you have to tailor your speech to a really unique demographic. It's 40% prosecutors, 40% defense attorneys, and 20% freeloading judges who they let in for free. And so I read every review, and traditionally there are haters. People are like, Brian Weiss hates judges and prosecutors, never have them back. And then I still get like three eights and three nines. So because I am in front of my target demographic, as we say in TV, 
my talk today, while largely marrying what we talked about last week, in the words of Eddie Murphy, may be a little raw. Okay, so I know that you guys will be on board. If anybody's ever seen me argue an appeal or give a CLE speech or do TV or read a brief, you know that it's much more likely that I am going to use references, sound bites from sports and movies more so than from Southwest Third. Because so much of what I've learned and so much of what me in doing what we do comes from those kinds of sources. What I learned in law school from my law professor. So what we're going to talk about today when we talk about preservation of air, and we see this PowerPoint that was put together by Kevin Bratcher, third year law student at South Texas, incredibly talented kid. You're going to see infinitely more references to sports and movies than you will to things that, that don't really matter in life, like estates and land, latches, the fertile octogenarian, and of course, res ipsa loquitur. So, I, Another thing, if you know about me, you know that I'm down here to actually try cases with the frequency of Halley's Comet. I mean, that's not what I do. And my heart and my respect are with each and every one of you in this room who do it on a daily basis. But I've been privileged to be part of some pretty high-profile trial teams of the late, great Dr. Michael Brown, Jeffrey Stern, Adrian Peterson, Ashley Benton. And it wasn't until this past March that I came down here to actually try a case again since the summer of 42. I had the privilege of being an attorney pro tem, fancy legal term for special prosecutor. Yet, yeah, not just with Ken Paxton, but I had the privilege to try a defendant named Dustin Deutsch, who was a DA investigator who decided it was going to be cool to help himself to a couple hundred thousand dollars of rare comic books from an evidence shed in North Houston. And I had the privilege of trying that case as a pro tem with Jim Mal and Billy Bell, two great guys and a privilege of trying it against three great lawyers on the other side, Aaron Epley, uh, Alicia O'Neill, and of course, uh, the lovely and talented Chipper Lewis. By the way, the legislature did pass a statute, this is part of legislative update, that any case involving any kind of publicity, Chipper has to be involved in, or it's a state jail felony. A lot of people don't realize that. And tried it in front of a great judge, Terry Flanagan, who they, they brought in from the country. Um, and so what did I learn from that? Well. What Ferris Bueller tells us, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you can miss it. Yeah, buddy, let me tell you, trying Deutsch basically was a primer once again And what can happen in a trial. Because trials like life, like Ferris tells you, happen really fast. They happen in real time. And there are so many moving parts. The judge, the jury, the media, your client, your co-counsel, your opposing counsel, if you are not ready to deal with it and stop and look around once in a while, you're going to miss something. And when you miss something, remember, we're not talking about being a civil lawyer across the street. We are not talking about who put the lettuce on the floor, Kroger. We're not talking about who entered the intersection first. What everybody in this room does affects real people. And if you mess it up, in the words of Michael and Godfather One, you're going to have to answer for Santino, okay? So what can you do? What will put you on the path to making sure that because life moves so fast that you won't miss anything? Well, I don't have a slide for it because it only occurred to me like the other day. One of my favorite Patrick Swayze movies, Roadhouse, okay? Dalton, all right? What did Dalton say? Expect the unexpected. Don't underestimate your opponent. In other words, obviously, when you walk in the elevator on the way to a district or county court, you better have a plan. All right? Well, you know, there's only one problem with that, folks. Thank you for turning your cell phone off. I'm going to have the bailiff confiscate it. Everybody has a plan, in the words of noted legal sage Mike Tyson until they get punched in the mouth. I had to clean that up a little bit because I think somewhere in there there's an F-bomb. Well, yeah, there is an F-bomb. Look, it's, it's not a question of if you're going to get knocked down when somebody's going to punch you in the mouth. It's a question of when. And again, it could be anybody. I've had it happen to me, my co-counsel, a member of the media, the judge, 
a juror giving me the finger. I mean, it will happen. Everybody in this room understands that. So what do you do? What is your legal EpiPen to jam in your leg when your case starts circling the drain? Well, for the last decade, if anybody heard me give this speech, particularly at the Advanced Criminal Law course, who was it? It was, it was Joe DiMaggio. Okay, remember, there may be somebody out there that's never seen you play before. And it was great until it wasn't. And then in those reviews, they're like, dude, you need to friggin' retire Joe DiMaggio. So we retired Joe DiMaggio uh, by a vote of the planning committee last year. And so who have we passed the baton to? When I ask you to remember that one soundbite, your true north, ladies and gentlemen, I give you bum and Earl. What did Bum used to say about Earl when Earl would score a touchdown? He didn't dance, he didn't spike the ball, he didn't hand it to his agent in the stands. What? He acted like he'd been there before. Okay? That is your mindset when you walk into court. And if not, do me a favor. Walk across the street, take some ad litem appointments, figure out who stole the oil field equipment in civil court, and everybody will be much better off for it. But just don't take it from Bum and Earl. Take it from another one of my heroes, Tracy Christopher, former civil district judge, justice on the 14th Court of Appeals, one of the best of the bunch. And I don't know how you can read that, but basically what she says is preservation of error is tricky. How can our system of justice make sure that error is preserved? She goes on to talk about a couple of things. One, making sure that this topic isn't relegated to a breakout session, that it's in the plenary session. And then she says, checklist for preservation would be useful. Well, done and done. Number one, I will send you my paper. I will give you my email address. It's also in the title card. It's Weiss Law, all lowercase, one word, W-I-C-E-L-A-W, at att.net. And last year, for the first time, we included, because Tracy Christopher told me to, a checklist on preservation that you can take to court to you. The other thing is, the planning committee, the advanced criminal law course, every year recognizes that preservation is such an important topic that it needs to be, as we say, in the big ballroom. And it was again this year, last week. Well, another movie reference, now that we know what Tracy Christopher thinks. One of my favorite scenes and one of my favorite movies, Wall Street, Gordon Gecko talking to Bud Fox. And he tells him, quoting Sun Tzu, let me hear it, every battle is won or lost before it's ever fought. And why is that important? Why does error preservation matter? Because there are some figures that ought to give you gray hair. 90% plus conviction rate in felony cases, 95 plus percent affirmance rate in non-capital cases, a third to a quarter of all appellate Matters in criminal cases involve what? Ineffective assistance of counsel. Let me tell you, I have been there. I have been there as an expert witness. I've been there as a lawyer. I've been there as a special master. It is not a lot of fun. Better you listen to what we talk about today. Better you download the paper with the checklist, and you won't find yourself on the hot seat. Well, so what does this all translate to? You know that guy is? That's the great one, a.k.a. Wayne Gretzky. What? You didn't know that. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it's been. What does that mean? Like the great one, it's about anticipation. It is about anticipating every conceivable legal issue that you think is going to impact your case. You know, on my computer screen, I have a couple of things that I cut out that I look at every day. One of them is a very simple quote. This is the underlying narrative. What is this case all about? You know who said that? At a CLE speech in 2008 when I was the course director at the advanced course? Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz spoke for 45 minutes without a note, and I thought to myself, I should have paid to get in here. But remember, before he became Ted Cruz, he was like another Ted Cruz, who was one of the finest appellate lawyers in the history of, of this country. He went like, you know, 19 and 2 in the Supreme Court in cases that he argued. So you need to know what the underlying narrative in your case is. What is it all about? That's what anticipation is. Is your case going to involve self-defense, mistake of fact? Does it involve a snitch trying to cut a deal? Is it jury nullification? 
And that is coupled with preparation. Researching the law on every one of those issues that you think is ultimately going to impact your case. Because everyone, I mean everyone who went to Faber College and was a member of Delta House recognizes knowledge is good, okay? The Deltas. And so if you listen to anything I say today, if you write down anything that we allude to, write those down. Those are valuable research resources. You know, back in the day when I was a young lawyer, you had to pay. Yes. You had to pay for slip opinions. A woman named Fenora Deputy, who worked at the Court of Criminal Appeals, had this hustle where she put her kids through Ivy League colleges, charging people for slips. And then you didn't get them for days, sometimes weeks later. You get slips in real time every day of the week. The first citation is to the Texas Judiciary's portal. Those are the 14 Courts of Appeals, the CCA, and the Texas Supreme Court. The second one is to the Fifth Circuit. The third one is to the United States Supreme Court. The fourth one, you need to write down. One of the secrets in the criminal justice system is the office of the state prosecuting attorney. Nobody knows what they do, except the people who work there. But what they do is they, they backstop prosecutors all across Texas, and they represent the state and the CCA. Uh, Lisa McMinn was the SPA. A good